Here's the deal. Let's say that you want to change the law in New York City. Maybe you want to ban annoying sports betting commercials, or perhaps you want to legalize violence against people who stand aimlessly in the middle of sidewalks. So where would you go to change these laws? A lot of people would probably call the mayor, because TV and movies have led us to believe that mayors are basically all powerful in their respective cities. But in reality, the mayor does not write the laws. The city council does. So here's what you need to know about the New York City Council. The city council comprises a single legislative body, which means it is unicameral. In contrast, the US Congress has two legislative bodies, the House of Representatives and the Senate, as does the New York State Legislature, with the State Assembly and the State Senate. These are both bicameral institutions. There is one seat in the city council from each of the 51 districts across the five boroughs. In general, being on the city council is a four-year term, with a limit of two back-to-back -back terms. It is intended to be a full-time position, with an annual salary of almost $150,000, but city council members are also forbidden from receiving any outside income. The city council is led by the speaker, who is elected by city council members and must be a city council member themselves. The city charter, which is a bit like the Constitution of New York City, has a number of checks and balances to limit the power of the speaker. However, in practice, due largely to the fact that city council members have overwhelmingly been from the same political party, the speaker is very powerful. You see, since 1915, the city council has been consistently controlled by members from the Democratic Party. At the time of writing, only five seats are currently controlled by Republicans, two from Staten Island, two from Queens, and one from Brooklyn. Keep in mind, that's five seats out of 51 following the 2021 elections. And this was considered a good year for New York City Republicans. In any case, the main function of the city council is to pass citywide laws. Each proposal can only cover one subject, which is quite different from the omnibus bills passed by the US Congress. Each city council proposal must also include an analysis of how it would impact the city's finances. If the city council votes to approve a bill, then it goes to the mayor's desk. The mayor can approve it or veto it. If the mayor does nothing, the bill will become law after 30 days. If the bill is vetoed, the city council has 30 days to override the veto, which requires a two-thirds majority. If the city council wants to change something that impacts the city charter, then it must be approved by voters in a general election. The city council participates in and has the final say on the lengthy process of crafting the city's budget, although initially each yearly budget begins with a proposal from the mayor. The city council can vote on setting real estate taxes and other taxes that have been approved by the New York State Legislature. The New York City Council cannot levy taxes without prior approval. We will examine this a bit later. Speaking of the mayor, as I discussed in my video about the responsibilities of the mayor, one of the mayor's responsibilities is to appoint the heads of various city agencies. Mayors can make most of these appointments on their own, but some require city council approval, like for the head of the Department of Investigations or for the members of the Board of Elections. This is an example of checks and balances in citywide government. The city council also oversees all city agencies to make sure that they are fulfilling their obligations to the city. The mayor leads these agencies, and the city council has the power to hold them accountable. Last, the city council plays a big role in approving, denying, or requesting modification in land use decisions. You see, in a municipality like New York City, with some of the most densely populated areas of the country, effective use of land is critically important. As a result, the land use decision process in New York City is very important, but also pretty complicated, so I'm not going to be going terribly in depth in this video. Perhaps I'll talk about this again in the future. In short, if one business closes down and a similar business wants to move in, then there typically won't be a problem. However, when someone wants to alter the land use rules themselves, such as issues of rezoning or proposing some broad urban renewal project, that's when the city council can get involved. Other entities, most notably the City Planning Commission, Community Boards, and even the offices of Borough Presidents, also have roles to play with land use issues. However, even in land use issues that are not mandated to be covered by the City Council, the City Council can still vote to have oversight. The City Council does not have absolute control over laws within the city. As we discussed a couple of minutes ago, the City Council needs approval from the New York State Legislature to pass certain laws and to levy taxes. Additionally, all New York City laws are subjugate to New York State laws, and likewise, all New York State laws are subjugate to laws of the United States. To use a silly, made-up example, if the federal government were to ban people from going to Olive Garden, then both the New York State Legislature and New York City Council couldn't really do anything about it. 
However, if the New York State Legislature banned people from eating at Arby's, then other states and territories could do as they please, but the New York City Council would be powerless. And if the New York City Council decided to ban people from eating at Papa John's, it wouldn't affect anyone who lives outside of the five boroughs. These examples might be silly and made up, but it demonstrates the dynamic under which the New York City Council operates. Legislators in New York City are somewhat at the mercy of higher-up political entities. Debating the balance of power between the federal government and state governments, and state governments and municipal governments, is commonplace. And that's because the balance between state government and municipal government, especially in the example of New York City, can have serious implications. One real-world, not silly or made-up example of this is the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, or MTA, which operates the vast majority of public transit options in New York City. Although many people associate the MTA with New York City, it is technically a New York State agency. This means that most changes to how the MTA administers public transit in the city needs to go through the state government and not the city government. That's kind of a big deal, given how central to many New York City residents' lives the buses and subways are. Let's review. The New York City Council passes legislation for New York City, which then gets sent to the mayor's desk. There are 51 city council members from all five boroughs, and they generally can serve up to two consecutive four-year terms. The city council also participates in the oversight of citywide agencies, passing annual budgets, land use reviews, and the appointment of some positions in city government. However, the city council is constrained by the city charter, as well as having to be subjugate to New York state laws and federal laws.